Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is a different format for our weekly uh, strategic insight. Uh, the purpose for that is the one thing that really keeps me up at night as the firm grows is that I don't have the opportunity to be in conversation with each of you individually. That is why we push to be, you know, present in the media and why we publish at least weekly, you know, our thoughts on the markets and why we talk all the time internally about making sure we meet with the clients and we have the conversations. And so we have a very deliberate communication strategy, but I finished a meeting up the other day uh, with Teresa and one of her clients. And she said, man, I wish you could have that conversation with all the clients. And so this is a role play where Teresa is gonna represent all the clients. And we're gonna have a conversation about the markets that by the way, is not scripted to try and give you a feel for what you know these dynamic conversations uh, are like and hopefully answer some of the questions that you may have. So I don't have any slides, which is uncomfortable. Woo! Yeah. I'm also a little bit jealous that Perry Green got to do a video last week. So I wanted to jump in front of the camera. So with that, here's what we're gonna do. Teresa, you ready for this? I am ready. All right, so apparently you're Teresa, every client, and you were sitting in your living room, and I have just walked in the room as the CEO and Chief Investment Strategist for Waddell & Associates. I'm all yours. Fantastic. So my first question would be, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, for those of you who know me, uh, you know, let's start big picture, and then we'll get down into the details. Um First of all, let's remember that just two years ago, uh, we had this pandemic that robbed the economy through all the quarantines and the shutdowns of $2 trillion in economic activity. And so the Federal Reserve and Congress came together and they injected into the economy $10 trillion, right? $10 trillion into a $20 trillion economy. So that's a little bit like feeding a pig to a python, right? Now, you put a pig in a python, it's good for the python. The python lives, right? And it probably tastes good at first, but I would bet the processing of that pig inside the python is not all that comfortable. So that's kind of what's going on. So let's just walk through the sequence of events and then figure out kind of where we are now. So 10 trillion goes in, right? Um, demand surges. And when demand surges, profitability for corporation surges, stock prices surge, Companies get excited, they increase their orders, the put pressure on suppliers, suddenly scarcities emerge, um, supply chains start groaning. And so those suppliers jack their prices up too. Next thing you know, the price of goods and services goes through the roof, unemployment levels fall, right? Because everybody is trying to build up capacity and supply to meet this overstimulated level of demand. Um, this goes on until it starts concerning the Fed, because the Fed looks at the surge in asset prices and says, yeah, we don't really get paid to regulate that. Then they look at the surge in uh, goods and service prices and they say, yeah, that's a problem. So they start cranking up their narrative. Now, normally they'd say, we're monitoring this. We might be interested in raising rates a quarter of a point. But because there was a hockey stick leg higher in inflation, they got much more aggressive in their commentary. I've never heard them so aggressive. And so their idea was to scare interest rates higher, to scare asset prices lower, and put everybody on alert that they will do everything within their power to bring inflation back towards their long-term targets of, call it, 2 2%. Wait, um, so, so all of that was intentional? Yes. They yes. scared us on purpose. Yes. There are three things the Fed can use in its policy tools. Number one is guidance, which is really conversational, right? Loosening or tightening. Um, and then they have the price of money, which is interest rates. They can set that. And we've gone from zero to one, basically. And then they have the quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. They can use their balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're used to them basically doing interest rates and a little bit of commentary, Um now they're doing a whole lot of commentary. They haven't done much with interest rates and they're starting quantitative tightening. So they freaked everybody out and they did it on purpose. So what happened was um, interest rates rose. So we went from zero to two and a half percent kind of more on the, the two year. 
On the 10 year, we went from one and a half to 3.15. These are dramatic lifts, right? And in mortgages, I know you're in Nashville and people don't think, you know, housing activity can ever slow, but with mortgage rates at five and a half percent, you probably see a slowdown and we're starting to see that nationwide in housing as well. So suddenly you have these jump hires in interest rates. And then what happens is that people like me who build spreadsheets have to discount profits more because the cost of money is higher. So that brings multiple down in the stock market. Um, those that don't have profits are really punished at a time like that. So if you look at Bitcoin, down 60%. If you look at profitless technology companies and 40% of the Russell 2000 small cap index is profitless technology. Well, not technology necessarily, but profitless companies. They're down 65%. The IPO index is down 65%. So there was a lot of excess that just got hammered a la what happened at the end of 1999. Good news is we sort of expected that and we stayed as clear of it as we possibly could. But unfortunately, everything kind of got drawn into that re-rating valuation jet wash, right? Um, so, but now if, uh, if you look at where valuations are today, the small cap index trades at 11.6 times down from now. Sorry to interrupt. Can you explain multiples and PE ratio? Because you right. talk about a lot in your weekly email that, yeah. that I receive every Sunday morning. Um, so you got P's, right? And P is the price of a stock, 100 divided by its earnings, 50. And so you got a P, you know, whatever that is, two. Um, not a real good example because there aren't a lot of twos in PE land, except for Russian stocks, maybe. Um, they're probably negative at this point. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, um, so the PE is a function of the um, earnings of the company and then the multiple you're willing to pay for those earnings. So if the earnings are 100 and it's got a PE of 10, then you're willing to pay $1,000 a share, right? Um, so what do, we wanna, what do we wanna have right now, a high or a low ratio? So... In an environment where interest rates are rising, where inflation is rising, that puts pressure on PEs, brings them down, brings them down. So the PE on the S&P topped out at call it 22, 23, and it's about 16 and a half now. So pulls them down. The PE on the mid cap index about 22, it's about 12 now. The PE on the small cap index was 22 as well. It's about 11 and a half now. So the compression in the PEs is related to the increase in interest rates and the increase in inflation, right? Um, however, if you look, the markets have sort of started to stabilize recently. Um, and here's why. So the Fed got really, really, really aggressive, backtracking a little bit. Fed got really aggressive, um, scared away um, a lot of you know, demand, maybe. Recession odds are going up. Um, economic reports are coming in below expectations right now as everybody goes, wait a sec, maybe the Fed is really willing to put us into recession. Maybe they are. Um, but the just the fear of that, you can worry yourself sick in an economy and that's what the Fed has hoped we do. And now we're there. So now what's happened is that the inflation expectations have started to roll over. So right now I'm going to do a little data. Hold on just a little bit right now. And this about is why I think chart with a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, notes. Okay. But this is why I think inflation's breaking. So if you look at the five year, right now going forward five year, and this is marketplace pricing, this isn't some economist. If you look at five year forward break even inflation, it's fallen over the last month from 3.59 to 287. So the market thinks inflation is going to be 2.87 over the next five years. Then there's a five year five-year forward expectation rate that looks at the next five years. The next five years, it expects inflation. It did expect it to be 2.67 a month ago, now 2.23, okay? okay? For the entire 10-year time frame, we've gone to 2.55, down from 3.02. So inflation expectations are falling. So if you're the Fed and your concern is runaway inflation, what you've done is you've talked the marketplace down, right? Valuations have come down significantly. Economic data is starting to sputter, right? You're talking this economy into a recession. The inflation data is starting to come down um, and inflation expectations are starting to come down. So I think, at least for the moment, the reason you're seeing things stabilize a little bit in the markets 
is because the fever has broken. So I don't know, right? I don't think we're going to go into a recession anytime soon. Um, I don't know if the Fed is still committed, right, to having to put the economy into recession. I never thought they really were um, to deal with inflation. But now they've got to pivot, I think. And the most important piece of information that happened this week that nobody really paid attention to is that Fed Chair Bostic in Atlanta said, maybe we should pump the brakes, right? Maybe we're being a little too tight. You mean um, pump the brakes on the Fed's activity? Yeah. Not, well, yeah. well, just, did, you know, Powell has said, we'll do what it takes. By the way, we're going to raise 50 basis points in June. We're going to raise 50 basis points in July, which puts us up at, you know, 2% uh, within the next couple of months. Um, and then maybe they need to take a break or maybe they need to soften some of that rhetoric because when inflation, if, even if you go back to the 70s, when you look at it, it doesn't do this. It doesn't go up and plateau. It goes up and then it falls back. Now, if it sets a higher low, that's an issue, right? But inflation moves in cycles, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. It doesn't do this, right? So now it's rolling over. They've pre-committed or set marketplace expectations. They're going to raise another percent over the next two months. I'm not sure they really need to. So James Bullard, who is the most hawkish person on the Fed right now, is going to be in Memphis next week. And he's going to be irritated because I'm going to be with him at breakfast. And I'm also going to be with him at lunch. And if he can soften his rhetoric a little bit, then maybe we've put a floor under where things are in terms of the valuation compression, at least. Um, so, so it feels... I'll, take a, I'll take a breath. Sorry. you know. I like that. <laughs> so I, I hear exactly what you're saying, but my portfolio values have decreased quite a bit. And so it's very difficult to do nothing. Surely there's something that we should be doing to take advantage of everything that you just said. What is that? So the question is, do you, do you fire the market, right? And which market are you in? So the P.E. ratio in our portfolio is about 14 and a half, right? The S&P is 16.7. If you look at small cap growth, it's about 30 and a half. So we've been hiding in our bunker of lower P.E. stuff. That's been the right decision, right? Um, could have sold, timed it perfectly, gotten back in, but that never really works. I don't really see a recession near term. And so we maintain our investment posture within the markets. We just do it in a way that gives us a little bit more comfort and security. So I'm, 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 I'm not overjoyed because I don't like, you know, down ticks in the portfolio, but at least having gone through this and foreseen most of it. I mean, we foresaw the war between um, Powell and inflation, mm -hmm. the Fed and inflation. I didn't foresee the war between Putin and the Ukraine. Um, and I didn't foresee the war between China, well, Beijing and Shanghai with the lockdowns, right? So those complicated things a little bit. Um, but I think um, from a portfolio structure standpoint, we're in the right location. What we can do and what Perry talked about is continue to harvest any tax losses we can, because that just ends up being you know, a rate of return, because uh, if you can reduce taxes going forward, that's no different than the stock market going up, right? A savings is the same thing as a gain. So, but you said you force, you can foresee things. So talk to me about why you can't just wait for the market to go up, go to cash, wait for it to come down, get back in the market. I mean, kind of seems like it would be easy. Why is it not? Yeah. Going? So for sure, we saw the conflict between Powell and inflation coming, which is why we got lower in terms of multiples within our portfolio to avoid that sort of valuation reset. That was successful. Didn't see the Ukraine coming, didn't see the China lockdowns coming, but we don't advocate hedging or really raising cash or getting out of the game unless um, a recession is, is somewhat imminent, which is what we did back in 2019 when we were tightening fiscal policy and monetary policy and my recession dashboard was lighting up red. So we went and hedged um, in that environment. Dashboard's not blinking red in, in, in a recession. And the reason why that's relevant is in any given year, you're going to have a 15% drawdown in the stock market on average, right? And trying to time the top and trying to time the bottom on a 15% drawdown is nearly impossible. If 
completely impossible. Um, and if you're wrong, you know, a little bit on the top and you're wrong a little bit on the bottom, you've generated a lot of taxes and taxable accounts, and you really haven't gained anything in terms of return. It's just not worth doing. However, in a recession, the average drawdown is something like 36%, right? So there's enough bandwidth there that you can be wrong a little bit on the top and you can be wrong a little bit on the bottom, pay a little tax and still have you know, returns that you can you can add to the to the um, to the to the return stream. So unless there's a recession, trying to go to cash is too hard to do. And well, it there- sounds like even in 2019 you didn't go to cash. It sounds no, like no, 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 no. Even even in our most uh, negative posture, we would effectively hedge out 40 percent of our exposure. What do you do when you hedge? What does that mean? So what we'll do is we have a portion of the portfolio that's 20 percent. Okay. And we basically have that in without getting too technical, just market participation, right? And if we feel like uh, the markets, imagine that as sort of the fine tuning knob in the portfolio. And if we feel like the markets are overvalued and a recession is imminent and this looks kind of scary, we can flip that exposure from being long the market to being short the market, which effectively hedges out uh, at a 20% position, 40%. So we could take it to cash. And then we'd have a 20% cash position, or we could short it and have a 40% sort of cash position just because we're inverting the trade, if you will. Um, So you're buying something that will increase in price as the rest of the market decreases. Correct. Correct. And that's what helped us back in 2020 was we had a short position within the portfolio that appreciated a lot, and that reduced the downturn. Um, So we'll never go to to 100% cash. that's just not a sane long-term investment strategy, right? Markets over a long period of time do this. If you can improve upon that, that's fantastic. And if you can reduce the the declines, that's fantastic. Um, But jumping in and out, um, nobody's done that successfully that I've ever seen. What about uh, my portion of my account that's in fixed income? Because, you know, I thought that was supposed to be pretty stable, but that's gone down too. Not as much as the equity side, you know, the stock side, but it's down more than I would expect. So this has been a very challenging um, quarter or two for the markets. In fact, it's been one of the most challenging on record because the aggregate bond market index in light of raising rates has fallen significantly. Um, the overall headline returns, which we've improved upon in the stock market, have come down um, considerably. And so there's been nowhere to hide. So it's looked like the bonds haven't really been portfolio insurance. Um, and that's true to a certain extent, but I think that's temporary, right? Um, what bondholders receive over time is interest payments, um, which is set by interest rates and then maybe a little bit of return if the credit quality of the you know, issuer improves or something like that. So when interest rates are zero, you're not getting much bond return, right? Between zero and 3%, that means your your principal value gets diminished. um, And so you take what looks like a capital loss on the bond, but your coupon's rising the whole time. So I think what's happened is we've gone from zero to call it 3% in the 10 year. But if you sort of track what I'm saying, I don't expect that rate to go to five or six or whatever the forecasters are saying. I think inflation is going to start to chill here. So there's been some pain while there was that re-rating in interest rates, but now the coupons are higher, which can start compensating you for the pain that you endured and then rewarding you going forward. Because again, you'd much rather have a bond yielding 5% than yielding two. Um, so I think I think it's been a temporary adjustment, but you know rates have already started to come back down. So we peaked at 315 on the 10 year. I think today we're at 287 or something like that. So they've already started to come back down, which has actually been decent for bondholders. And some people are, are, are stepping back into bonds. So I think that was a temporary hiccup, painful, but higher rates of interest are, are a good thing. And we've got long term investors. So I think what I heard was sit tight, don't make any changes. In that fixed income. Yeah, I, I can I can say it again in a 45 minute spot if you want. <laughs> no, thank you. So also, um, when should I expect my account values to be back to where they were, you know, maybe last year? We believed, or I, you know, talked a lot about, I guess, in the in the um outlook 
that we expected the first half of the year to be kind of soggy anyway, right? I mean, the Fed was going to have to deal with inflation and and all of that stuff has come to bear. Didn't expect Russia, didn't expect, you know, China shut down. Um, so we expected kind of a lame year, at least in the first half, until we get to the point where inflation readings start to, to descend in a meaningful way where people go, oh, inflation, we're in a downtrend. I imagine that happens around, I'm just guessing, but I imagine that happens around September because you got to put a few months worth of readings um, in the pipe before before anything really really manifests on the return side. So I think, I think when we get past that um, and you go back to the historical analogs, let's say that, um, by the way, analysts have been increasing earning ex- expectations this whole time. So right now, the street believes earnings will grow 10% this year, 10% next year. Okay. Insiders at corporations are buying their own stocks at record levels, right? Additionally, corporations are starting to do large buybacks again. So the insiders within corporations are buying their stocks right now. The analysts expect earnings will grow. Valuations have come down significantly. You're setting yourself up if we don't go into recession for what could be a pretty powerful rally, right? So I know it's not consensus, but my guess is we get through this, the Fed cools a little bit, inflation rolls over. And as we get into the back half of this year or into next year, things can really, you know, accelerate pretty meaningfully within within market and within prices. Oh. But, but I, I still want to own companies that make money, right? I'm not jumping into broken technology names. I think there's plenty of money to be made in the value side of the portfolio, still uh, plenty of upside and low PE names. We're not going to go chase fallen angels. That's not what we're going to do. Well, you have brought me great comfort and convinced me. And now I should disclose that I have a big pile of cash. What should I do with it? I think you start dollar cost averaging it in here. Right. What does that mean? Okay. So I would put, how big a pile do you have, Teresa? <laughs> I don't know. Don't keep secrets from your financial planners, Teresa. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I would say we're in the seasonally weak part of the calendar anyway. There's a lot of cross currents. It's going to take a little while for for either Fed language to soften or for those inflation reads to start trending lower. But you know, I put a quarter of that to work today, um, and I'd start dollar cost averaging the rest of it in probably until my birthday, September 21st. Um, and then I think you go into the back half of the year with more courage. I like the point. So dollar, dollar cost averaging, for those of you who are watching who may not know that jargon, um, explain it periodically. Yeah. Dollar the, cost averaging. The, 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 way, the way we do it is we'll set a time frame, right? So in this one, it's relatively short because it's September. And then either every week or every other week, we put in equal increments, right, to get to fully invested by that period, unless something crazy happens and there's a tactical new used or something like that, and the market goes down 20%, then we can accelerate the purchases, right? So, so we're going to be automated unless we have an opportunity to be opportunistic in the event that there becomes a fire sale for whatever reason, and then we can accelerate those purchases. Sounds like a smart way to do it. All right. Anything else that we should know about the environment right now? Anything um, to be prepared for? What, what's some of the good news? The good news is that there, everybody thinks there is no good news, right? Um, the good news is the valuations are the lowest I've seen them on small caps since the bottom in 2020 and the bottom in 2008. So we have done the kind of damage in valuations that typically occur during a recession, and we, did, we haven't had a recession, right? Um, so there's been a lot of damage that's been done. There's been a lot of heavy lifting done to correct the excesses within this marketplace. Furthermore, I don't really see excess leverage in the household sector. I don't see excess leverage in the financial sector. I don't see excess leverage in the corporate sector. Definitely excess leverage in the crypto sector that's being dealt with. Excess leverage in the profitless tech sector that's being dealt with. Um, so I don't see any financial crisis is brewing. You know, I often get questions on, well, the dollar is no longer going to be the reserve currency and don't I need to own gold, et cetera. Gold is up 2% this year. That's good in a market that's down 17%. The dollar's up 5.5%. 
So most people think the dollar is going away. The dollar is not going away. Um, in fact, everybody on the planet wants dollars, right? Because what do you, do you want Chinese yuan with them shut down? And do you want the ruble? And, you know, I mean, most people on the planet, if you had the opportunity, I mean, I went to Bermuda the other day at a conference and what did they want? They wanted my U.S. dollars. Now the Bermuda dollars peg one to one, but everybody on the planet wants dollars if they can get them. So the dollar's up five and a half percent. It's not going away. Um, I don't think interest rates run away from here. I think inflation's rolling over. Inflation expectations have rolled over, which means the Fed narrative is rolling over. Corporate earnings are still strong. I looked this morning at the Fed's estimate for Q2 GDP growth, and it was 2.6%. So the the, the recession, if, if, it, if it's on its way, isn't showing up in my dashboard. Um, now, slower growth may. Maybe we don't grow at 7% or 5% or whatever that pig moving through the Python provided. Um, but our long-term growth rate really should be about 1.9 to 2. So we're actually still growing above potential GDP. So there's a lot of good news out there. It's just we've, we've had a big re-rating in valuations that was overdue and just sequentially part of the process of this pig moving through the Python. Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, setting up this role play so that we can deliver this to our clients and let them peek into a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I know that I do need to let you go now so that you can jump into the investment committee meeting. <laughs> That's right. That's right, which would be tons of fun for that too. Um, I will say this, um, while I, I do this with, with some lightheartedness, um, nobody hates losing money more than me. And by the way, it's not a loss unless you sell. Um, so I've often said, if you can afford to pay somebody worry for you, do that. Um, we spend a lot of time worrying. Um, and that's a good thing. We spend a lot of time being optimistic, but we're balanced in our views here. So overall, I'm extremely pleased with how the portfolio is positioned. I do think we move through this. I don't see the recession. So I'm grateful for the union we have with the clients. N none of y'all really have been in panic mode. So I'm certainly not trying to incite panic by doing some special broadcast, um, but we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff and it matters. Um, so this was the attempt to try and be in conversation with a thousand of you. Um, so thank you, Teresa, for reading every week, but for those who would rather watch, you know, here's an option. <laughs> Thanks, David. And for those of you not receiving our weekly strategic insight every Sunday morning, please visit our website at wealthstrategistswithans.com and scroll to the bottom of the website and you'll be able to enter in your information and begin receiving our email. Thanks, guys.